Well, good afternoon, uh, depending on where you're logged in to uh, today. Uh, my name is Mike Kramer. I will be the presenter for this uh, this um, September monthly webinar. Um, as you can see from the uh, screen, uh, this uh, month's uh, topic is corrective action requirements and good practices. Uh, I want to thank everybody for for logging in. Um, As always, our, uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available in its entirely, entirely at our website at uh, www.pjlabs.com. <clears throat> we do have a training tab up there where uh, you can go to uh, recorded webinars. And this one, along with uh, past webinars, are, are available as a resource uh, for your listening and viewing. Um, uh, pleasure. If uh, this one in particular, if uh, you have a colleague that may have missed it, uh, usually it's um, up on our website within the next business day. Uh, the duration of this webinar should be approximately one hour. I don't anticipate it going that long. Um, there will be a time at the end um, allocated to um, answer some questions. Okay, to start off with, uh, one thing I would like to uh, present is a comparison. We have two parts of the standard, corrective action and we have preventive action. Um, corrective actions are steps that are taken to remove causes of an existing nonconformance or undesirable situation. Um, preventive action, on the other hand, are steps that are taken to remove the causes of potential or potential situations that are undesirable. So, uh, in a nutshell, corrective action is a re is reactive. A problem, a nonconformance has already happened. Preventive action, on the other hand, is proactive. A potential nonconformance or problem is foreseen, and um, preventive action has been implemented in order to prevent it from happening. Um, hasn't happened yet. Corrective action it has already happened. With this presentation, we're going to look at corrective action. However, a lot of the tools and the corrective action, root cause analysis, and things like that. Could be crosswalked over to preventive action. Probably the biggest uh, difference is uh, just uh, exactly when you implement corrective and when you implement uh, preventive. However, as far as once it's implementing implemented, uh, the um, this presentation should cover uh, those uh, steps that would be put into place for preventive action as well. We're going to dive in and we're going to look at the 17025 here. And the very first requirement uh, in Section 411, which is corrective action, is general 411.1. The laboratory shall establish a policy and, a, and shall designate appropriate authorities for implementing corrective action when nonconforming work or departures from the policies and procedures in the management system or technical operations have been identified. So further note there, a problem with the management system or with the technical operations of the laboratory may be identified through a variety of activities such as control of nonconforming work, internal or external audits, management reviews, feedback from customers and from staff audits. So a couple things I want to bring to light here. Um, a policy, you're, you're required, 17022, uh, 17025 requires a policy and procedure. A policy states what the intentions of the lab is. In other words, the lab will institute a corrective action when any of the elements of the quality management system is not being followed or a nonconformance is identified. And then you would have a procedure, which is, okay, you have this policy that stated the procedure is the instruction or method of how the organization will implement the policy. 
Now looking at the 411.1, also states the, um, the laboratory needs to designate appropriate personnel for the implementation of corrective action and to ensure it is implemented correctly. Typically, um, as an assessor, I go out and I do assessments on behalf of Perry, Perry Johnson Laboratory Accreditation. Uh, typically, I'll see this as a function of the designated quality manager. However, that uh, needs to be um, identified as far as implementing the corrective action policy and procedure. And um, lastly, there's a note there. It um, specifies the need of corrective action may arise from and this is not an all-encompassing um, list here. It goes into uh, various elements that uh, may arise, which uh, you would um, need to turn the keys and um, implement your corrective action uh, procedure. Non-conforming testing or calibration work, i.e., using a piece of equipment that was out of specs, a technician not following procedure, uh, using equipment that's like exceeded its calibration interval. Staff, staff observations. Perhaps you have a, a sharp employees that uh, may notice problems that uh, are being um, uh, done within the procedure. So having a staff observation, an example could be inadequate procedures brought forth through the staff. Internal audits. Uh, you're required at 17025 to, to uh, perform internal audits. If you have any findings in those internal audits, you will need to implement the correct procedure in order to um, identify the root cause and take appropriate corrective action. Management reviews, uh, need for per, uh, potential corrective action could arise during the management review meeting. We have external audits. We have, uh, in parentheses these there, you may have customers that may come in and audit your testing or calibration facilities or the accrediting body, PJLA, for example. We go in, we do assessments. Uh, if we have any non-conformances, they, of course, are written up, and we require the organization to submit to us on their corrective and corrective action documentation um, their corrective action that they're going to take in order to close the nonconformance. That along with any requested objective evidence is required by us at Perry Johnson prior to closing any nonconformances that uh, has arisen via the external audit done by PJLA. Um, other sources could be customer feedback. Um, you're required through 17025 to see customer feedback. And customer complaints. If valid complaints say comes through the organization, the lab may, um, of course, uh, need to act on uh, uh, customer complaints, especially if they're reoccurring, and institute the their procedure for um, control. Excuse me for corrective action. Going further uh, um, in within the standard 411, 411 two addresses cause analysis. Specifically, the procedure for corrective action shall start with an investigation to determine the root cause of the problem. Right off the bat there, and you see I highlighted start, um, the procedure for corrective shall start with this root cause analysis. Uh, as a note within the standard, cause analysis is the key and sometimes the most difficult part excuse me, in the um, corrective action procedure. Often the root cause is not obvious and thus a potential careful analysis of all potential causes of the problem is required. Potential causes could include customer requirements, the samples, sample specifications, methods and procedures, staff skills and trainings, consumables or equipment in its calibrations. So exactly what is a root cause? A simple definition would be a process to define, evaluate, and systematically analyze a problem to determine the underlying factor or reasons for the problem. So basically the objective of the root cause is to dig down to the roots, to get to the reason why the nonconformance occurred or if eliminated, will significantly diminish the likelihood of reoccurrence. 
Arnie Fleifel and Mayberry would say, nip it in the bud. So, um, as a further further depiction, a depiction of uh, root cause and root cause analysis here, uh, basically we have a problem. The, the problem is obvious. And, uh, so you can see a picture of the weed here. The underlying cause of the problem is actually below the surface. The word root and root cause analysis refer to the underlying causes, not the one cause. Hence, more than one root cause may be identified, which may require more than one corrective action. Root cause analysis is a technique that helps answer the question of why the problem occurred in the first place. It seeks to identify the origin of the problem using a specific set of steps with associated tools to find the primary cause of the problem so that you can, first, determine what happened. Second, determine why it happened. And then finally, figure out what to do to reduce the likelihood that it will happen again. A root cause analysis assumes that systems and events are interrelated. An action in one area triggers an action in another and another and so on. By tracing back, these actions can discover where the problem started and how it grew into the system symptoms you're facing now. I like to refer to, to it as working backwards. Applying root cause analysis can, can be thought of as uh, basically working backwards. You have a nonconformance, you have a problem, certain things were put into motion that led up to it, hence you work backwards to determine what the root cause exactly was. You typically find three basic root causes. Um, Identify them as physical causes, which are tangible materials, item failed in some way. I'm going to look at the, if you see the bottom of the, at the uh, um, slide here, we have a picture of a vehicle that apparently has a, had a little um, accident there. And um, physical causes of what exactly happened there. An example on here, the physical could be the brake stopped working. Well, we could take it a little further than that. Uh, human causes. People did something wrong or did not do something that was needed. Human causes typically lead to a physical cause. For example, okay, the brakes didn't work. No one filled the brake fluid, which led to the brakes failing. Okay, uh, so uh, take it even further. We'll look at uh, another... Um, uh, Type organizational causes, a system, process, or policy that people use to make decisions to do their work is faulty. For example, look at the situation below here. No one person was responsible for vehicle maintenance and everyone assumed someone else had filled the brake fluid. So it's obvious what the uh, problem was there at the top, the physical cause that the um, brakes did not uh, work, hence causing the mishap there. I'm um, digging a little bit deeper, we look at uh, human causes and organizational causes. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to look at the techniques for root cause analysis. A root cause analysis should be performed as soon as possible after the error or variance occurs. Otherwise, important details may be missed. All the personnel involved in the area should be involved in the analysis. Without all parties present, the discussion may lead to fictionalization or spe speculation that will dilute the facts. So root cause, uh, corrective action and root cause, there's a 
there's a wealth of information out there. There's various methods that can be done. There's a depiction at the on the um, slide here of uh, some of the more prevalent um, um, ways and techniques or methods of uh, performing a root cause analysis. We're going to take a look at just, just a few of these. I would say probably the most well-known and uh, the most popular um, technique is a, a method called the five whys analysis, which is basically exactly what it states. You ask why five, ask the why five times techniques. Um, by the time you get to the fifth why, you should have gotten to the root cause. So by repeatedly asking the question why, you can peel away the layers of an issue and get to the root cause of a problem. Keep asking why until you reach the act actionable level. All right, we're going to take the five whys and we're going to look at an example here of um, a problem that, that this happened. So we're going to have to take corrective action, which is depicted at the bottom of the screen here. So basically, a laboratory was cut by a dissection knife. Employing the five whys um, method, we asked the question why. The knife was left, excuse me, the knife was left in the sink. Once again, why? The area was not cleared on the previous day. Again, we'll ask why. Clearing is not a daily habit. Again, asking why for the fifth time. Why is uh, clearing not a daily habit? Because standard operating procedures slash documentation for clearing do not exist. Why? I think uh, in this particular example, uh, a, an accident has already happened. We've taken corrective action. We're um, going to employ the five whys. And uh, taking this down to the fifth why, uh, actually employing a standard operating procedure, perhaps employing it within the uh, work instruction as far as um, establishing requirements for cleaning the area, perhaps will prevent this from happening again. Okay, uh, five whys. Is, um, some of the advantages that, uh, in utilizing the five whys is, and, uh, is the tool is extremely easy to use, and it does not require a great deal of training. As a matter of fact, it can be used by any person at any level in the organization. However, it gives the best results when a team of people work on the problem together. Next, there is rarely any need to collect data for using this tool, and it does not call for statistical analysis of any sorts. So for small organizations, um, may not need to divulge into uh, perhaps uh, could have been the first accident that uh, ever happened uh, in a facility, and uh, may not have any other enough data to go back and, and look and look at any sort of workman compensation claims or anything um, as depicted in the previous example. Um, another advantage would be if a problem has more than one root cause, then this tool helps to determine the root causes between them. That was sort of depicted on the previous example. And the process generally unearths a whole lot of problems that are related to the main problem. So with advantages, we're going to look at a, a few disadvantages. Uh, confirmation biases. People tend to jump to conclusions when solving problems. The experience and inexperience alike fall victims when performing unguided deductive reasoning. Secondly, a uh, possible disadvantage was you can't go beyond current knowledge. You can't go beyond the person's current knowledge. One must know the cause and effect chain before one can find it. 
single cause issue. People often, often people who apply five whys just follow one casual chain. Since accident, accidents are seldom caused by a single casual factor, they only analyze a fraction of the issues that need to be solved. They miss the chance to solve the major problems. At the bottom there is a resource for you that divulges uh, a little bit uh, deeper into the 5Y analysis and the um, method uh, being employed here. Another popular method, uh, I would say, form behind the 5Ys um, that I see would be uh, what's called a fishbone or ishakawawa or cause and effect diagram. And this will group causes into categories. This may include people, measurements, methods, material, environments, and machine. The fishbone, excuse me, the fishbone diagram forces you to consider all possible causes of a problem instead of focusing on the most obvious one. Um, here, causes are grouped into several categories to easily identify the correct sources of the variation. Here we got a, uh, a, um, the onset of a um, fishbone diagram. Uh, moving on, see an example of uh, perhaps uh, here we have an um, issue that's being looked at, which is loss of sales. And um, on the screen is a... Uh, that listed into the various categories and then subcategories within those categories that uh, will be looked at in order to determine the cause of the problem. In this area, it's uh, loss of sales. Again, we'll go look at some advantages of the um, fishbone or Ishikawa or cause and effect diagram. Uh, one advantage is, is it identifies cause and effects relationships and problems. Secondly, the method operates through the function of joint brainstorming discussions. Uh, thirdly, uh, brainstorming allows for broad ranging thinking and steering, steering teams away from interrupt thinking patterns. The diagram asks, why does this happen again and again at each stage as potential causes is identified? And finally, uh, fishbone allows for prioritizing relevant causes so that predominating underlying root cause is addressed first. A couple disadvantages is, uh, it's, uh, may or may not disagree with these, uh, brainstorming produces irrelevant potential causes along with relevant ones, resulting in a time and energy drain. Brainstorming is often based in on opinion as on fact and evidence. Actually, a very large space for working out the diagram is needed for complex problems with many branching bones and Y bones. And finally, the complex interrelation of multiple factors are difficult to show on a fishbone. The uh, Paralto analysis, that's going to be the, the last one we're going to look at here. And you saw from the first uh, depiction there, there, there's many other. I just, uh, there are time constraints of uh, uh, so like three of these. Um, uh, what the Parto analysis does, it's also known as the uh, Parto principle or 80-20 rule, and it assumes that a large majority of problems, 80%, are determined by a few important causes, 20%. Um, it is a formal technique used where many possible courses of action are competing for attention. In essence, the problem solver estimates the benefits delivered by each action then selects a number of most efficient actions that deliver a total benefit reasonably close to the maximum possible one.
you'll see here in a little bit. I have a, a depiction of one where you can see it's a, it's a problem, and then there's a, or there's a problem. Then within that problem, there's various other problems that are incorporated into it. So in the simpling, simplest terms, Peralto analysis will typically show that a disproportionate improvement can be achieved by ranking various causes of a problem and by concentrating on those solutions or items with the largest impact. The basic premise is that not have the same or even proportional impact on a given situation. When causes are identified, other root causes analysis techniques such as the five whys or fishbone diagram can be used to dig down further. Okay, here's a chart here. We have a, um, an example of a, a part of our chart and here we have a broad nonconformist. It's just looking at, uh, with, uh, assume this is a, could be a production facility. Um, where uh, maybe having some issues with paint. Um, I'm going to look at the paint as a as the problem or nonconformance here. I'm going to break it down a little bit further. So we see the issues related to paint where they've been grouped down into uh, um, other um, needs for corrective action. You can see light spray is by far been the biggest issue with paint nonconformances. Runs, dips, blisters, and splatters are the top five there, which uh, will um, attribute to 80% uh, of the, um, the problems concerning uh, the nonconformances with paints. This will take each one of those separately, break it down, concentrate on uh, the, um, the biggest causes that uh, relate to paint nonconformances. Again, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, advantages, organizational efficiencies. Requires that organization lift changes that are needed, then they are ranked. Enhanced problem solving skills enables people to organize work related problems into cohesive facts. Um, and uh, finally, improved decision making. Documentation will enable better preparation and improvement in decision making for a future change. Going to look at some disadvantages here. Uh, one problem is it tends to focus on the past. Past data, data may not accurately represent the current situation. Uh, inaccurate problem solving. You should examine. You should, excuse me. You should examine the quality and relationship within each problem rather than using it for a strictly qualitative conclusion. Mistaken application may extend the usefulness of Pareto analysis beyond its intended application. And there's a uh, website there for reference for anyone who would, uh, would like to explore this method further. Okay, so we looked at root cause, we looked at root cause analysis, we looked at methods and techniques, um, um, which is the first thing according to the standard that you need to, uh, to um, do is find the cause, do your root cause analysis. Uh, 4.11.3, selection and implementation of corrective action. Um, where corrective action is needed, the laboratory shall identify potential corrective action. It shall select and implement the actions most likely to eliminate the problem and to prevent reoccurrence. So uh, these potential um, corrective actions have been identified. The so laboratory should implement corrective action after the decision has been made as to what course of action or actions would most likely fix the nonconformance and prevent the nonconformance 
from happening again. This next one here is still coming under uh, selection and implementation of corrective action. Corrective action shall be a degree appropriate to the magnitude and the risk of the problem. The easiest way I could think to explain this is uh, uh, a lab may choose to have different processes for corrective action depending upon depending on their severity. So, for example, we may have a single lapse, or we could have a break, uh, a total breakdown. At PJLA, we when we do write nonconformances, we identify them as a major or minor. A major, for example, let's say, for example, uh, you have an element, you have a requirement, you have a section in 17025 in regards to management reviews. Basically, you have to, to do them. You have to establish a predetermined schedule. Um, you have to have a policy procedure. It needs to address various issues. A major would be if that is a total lapse. Management reviews are not conducted. They're not addressed within the quality management system. It's a total breakdown in that area. Um, a minor would be perhaps uh, they're being done. They're being done according to a predetermined schedule. As an assessor, I'm reviewing your your um, management review, and I look and I see that uh, um, your management review that I'm reviewing did not take into account customer feedback, which is a requirement within 17025. Um, that uh, that would be considered a minor. <clears throat> Hence, the um, corrective action for the major uh, would be selected uh, differently than that opposed to the minor because the major is much more severe. It it's, um, represents a total lapse or a total absence of a required element um, which the lab needs to be complying with. Continue with select, uh, selection and implementation of corrective action, 11, excuse me, 4.113. The laboratory shall document and implement any required changes resulting from corrective action investigation. Hence, we're looking for records, saying we as an assessor or even you as a laboratory, if you're the quality manager or um, you're doing an internal audit in the laboratory, any corrective actions needs to be supported by a record, which our records are needed to support the compliance. Um, the records should support should support that a nonconformance was identified, root cause analysis was completed, potential corrective action identified, selected, and implemented. And you know, as you'll see here in a little bit, and that corrective action was monitored. Typically, as a assessor, uh, corrective action. Um, there's a policy and procedure. Um, typically, there's forms. Uh, the form is a document. Um, once you start writing on that form, it's become a record. So, hence, um, you may have a form that's dedicated to corrective action. Ideally, the form would mimic uh, what your procedure states, which hopefully complies with the requirement of 17025 where you would identify the very first thing is the root cause and then go in and list potential. Then uh, go ahead and select and implement one. And then uh, you'll see here in a little bit, <clears throat> once it's been implemented, <coughs> excuse me, it needs to be monitored and determined as effective, that it was effective. Which brings us to 411.4, monitoring of corrective action. I got the word highlighted there, shall. So a shall is a must. Those of you all that took my uh, webinar earlier in the year on um, internal auditing, we emphasize that, that whenever the word shall appears in the standard, that is a requirement. So the laboratory shall monitor the results to ensure that the corrective action taken have been effective. As we're looking at the uh, record should provide support that an effectiveness check was completed. 
There may have been several corrective actions that could have been implemented. If the initial corrective action does not work, or perhaps create additional problem solving, then repeat the process until the effective corrective action has been monitored and verified as being effective. The key to verification is evidence. The responsible personnel should seek factual evidence that the root cause has been reduced or removed. This evidence usually takes the form of data or records available. Um, another powerful form of evidence is your own first-hand observation. That's not easy to say that uh, you can't accept verbal evidence, but records, data, and first-hand observations are certainly better. A record should be retained that once corrective action had been and it was revisited and verified as being effective. So hence, uh, looking at a corrective action record, we see everything implemented. Uh, excuse me, uh, effective action, excuse me, corrective action actually implemented. Um, what I don't like to see is perhaps is uh, verified as being effective uh, one day after the fact that it was implemented. Um, let's say, for example, you had customer complaints that warranted a corrective action that had to do with turnaround time. Hence, you implemented a uh, corrective action that uh, put more resources into the, to, um, say, calibration, um, hence reducing that the turnaround time. It's going to be a little while before you can actually determine whether or not that corrective action has been effective. Um, and some, perhaps uh, as a means of uh, uh, determining whether it has been effective is perhaps 30 days, start recalling, calling on customers that has issued a concern over that and see if the problem has been um, resolved and it's no longer an issue with that particular customer. Again, I'd like to see a sign-off as an assessor and effective. I could question it more as to how did you determine it was effective, uh, but the requirement is that it has to be monitored and determined to be effective once it's taken. Lastly, under corrective action is a section 411.5 additional audits. Uh, and basically what this states is, right from the standard, where the identification of nonconformances or departure casts doubt on the laboratory's compliance with its own policies and procedures or on its compliance with its international standard, the laboratory shall ensure that the appropriate areas of activities are audited in accordance with 414 as soon as possible. And as a further note, such additional audit shall follow the implementation of corrective action to, confer, to confirm their effectiveness. Additional audit should be necessary only when a serious issue or risk to the business is identified. So uh, Section 414, of course, is a section on internal audits. Hence, if the uh, corrective action warrants an additional audit, you would need to revisit Section 414 whatever area of the standard that um, the nonconformance or the corrective action identified, that section would need to be audited as soon as possible. So what warrants an additional audit? An internal additional audit will need to be conducted in accordance with 414 when the determination of the root cause determines that the laboratory may not be in compliance with its own policies and procedures. And if you have a quality management system you've written, your quality management system complies with the standard. So within the QMS or quality management system, you are, state, you are stating exactly what you're supposed to be doing in order to comply with the standard. Um, hence, a, uh, an audit would be conducted if it's determined that uh, you are not in compliance with basically 
what's in effect within your own quality manual and your own quality management system and the policies and procedures that have been written to, to uh, support your operation and compliance with a standard, i.e. 17025, which um, leads to the uh, second internal audit, excuse me, the second reason in which corrective action may um, incorporate an additional audit would be when the determination of the root cause reveals that a laboratory may not be in compliance with ISO IEC 17025-2005 standard. Okay, uh, that brings an end to the uh, presentation that I've prepared for this month. What I'd like to do is um, take a pause for five minutes. There should be a place on your screen um, if you have uh, any questions. Uh, I'm being um, helped by our president at our Troy, Michigan headquarters, Ms. Tracy Sernzen, who will field those questions. I'm actually operating out of my home base in Virginia. She will field those to me. Uh, so what I'd like to do in these uh, next five minutes is if you have any questions, um, please feel free to type them in. Try to answer as many as possible. Um, if I'm fail to answer one, um, uh, please, um, you can still ask it, uh, can submit it directly to the uh, address that's specified here on this slide. Also, if something comes up that uh, you may have thought of after we sign off here, just they'll resort to um, asking at a later time via that um, that website. So I'll pause here. I'll give you the opportunity to uh, oh, maybe uh, reflect on this presentation. And if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them.
Okay, uh, welcome. Welcome back. Uh, a few questions here. Um, before I continue, I just want to uh, let you all know, uh, make you all aware that uh, we already have next month's uh, webinar, which is fastly approaching, you can see, uh, 4th of uh, October. And it's, it's a good one. It, and it uh, creates um, uh, questions when I'm doing assessments, and it's a Section 510, which is reporting the results. Ensure compliance with 17025. And when you think about it, um, that's the end result. That's the end result of uh, your quality management system. What you're putting out is a testing or calibration report, excuse me, uh, report uh, under your scope of accreditation is that, uh, that report. So uh, please, uh, you know, make a note and uh, look forward to uh, seeing everybody back here in um, in October. And then once again, uh, this uh, this one and all the previous webinars are available on our website under the resource tabs. Okay, I'll answer a few questions here. What if identified corrective action is too expensive to implement? That's kind of a, a broad question there. I would take it, uh, um, well, if you're complying with the standard, you need to address it. Uh, you need to do a root cause analysis. Um, if it's too costly, then I would suggest perhaps doing a cost-benefit analysis. Um, I used to work for a Fortune 500 company um, that uh, produced products. Uh, the cost of perhaps doing a massive recall um, as opposed to perhaps implementing a corrective action at a cost to determine, uh, to prevent the likelihood of that recall have to be done. And that's kind of a broad question. If it's too, too expensive, uh, of course, if it's without your resources, if it's out of your resources, of course, you're not going to be able to um, take the appropriate corrective action. Uh, perhaps um, not dig down as deep on the root cause, uh, try to try to address it um, at the surface. But, uh, you know, if, if, if the only uh, alternative is the expensive one, kind of hard to say uh, uh, what to do other than to bite the bullet or uh, perhaps suffer some consequences in your cost-benefit analysis there. Uh, this is an interesting question. This is just for uh, a general webinar. And this has never come up before, actually. And um, we have labs all around the world. We have assessors in different countries. So, uh, and I've never really considered this, but can the conference be available in a different languages? It's only in English, correct. Uh, however, in the future, we can look at offering this in Spanish. Um, I would say, uh, actually, I'm going to defer that to Tracy to put in her, <laughs> perhaps something for, for future discussions at PJLA. Um, we see the folks that, uh, that are logged on, they're registered, and uh, I'm not sure how we would implement that. I know I have a, um, a lady um, at headquarters there that helps me with some translation issues. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Again, the cost-benefit analysis of her going back and translating these and dubbing over my voice uh, is a one that comes to, to mind right away. But uh, um, that is definitely something that uh, I think we need to be looking at. All righty, I got another question here. This is not so much related to... Uh, um, calibra excuse me, calibration, um, corrective action. How can we handle the change um, calibration date and the, cer the calibration certificate date because a client needs to improve their calibration program? Um, is this a corrective action? Well, I would say, um, well, the only thing, it, it would be apparently your customer is taking corrective action and they need to uh, perhaps shorten a calibration interval. And you're getting into different areas of the standard here. That due date um, is required if that's specified on a calibration report. That has to be customer specified. Uh, if for whatever reason the customer needs to have a different due date on there, there is a section in the standard that uh, um, 
that the addresses is at the very end of 510 that regret addresses amendments and supplementation reports, excuse me, calibration and test reports. Say so if they need to change a due date on a calibration that's already been done, been done and that's coming from a customer, you can uh, supplement that calibration report. You just need to refer to the original, the date, test number, and unique identifying identifier, and perhaps uh, supplement it and change that date via that app via that avenue. Um, and again, you know, as far as a lab and a calibration facility, this shouldn't be an issue for a Cal lab because it's a requirement that uh, um, any calibration due date um, needs to be customer specified. That can't be specified by the lab. So any corrective action would have to be taken off uh, part of the customer. However, you know, in this particular instance, the lab can accommodate their client. Um, if the customer is a new due date on the certificate by, oh, I would say by supplement, or you could actually amend the certificate, and there's requirements for that as well, i.e., redo the certificate completely. Requirement there is you need to give it a unique identifier, and you need to, uh, um, uh, excuse me, you need to reference the certificate that it replaces. So right at the end of 510, there's two uh, two alternatives there, either supplementing it or amending it. I'm not sure if I answered the question. Um, again, uh, 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 if I have not uh, resubmit it, and uh, I will um, attempt to do it again. I'm not sure if I hit the root cause there of uh, what you were asking me there. Uh, so I have uh, for today. Um, no more questions. Again, uh, feel free to submit another question um, if one arises uh, later on uh, in the day. Um, again, thank everybody for logging in, and we look forward to, uh, to our next webinar at uh, scheduled uh, October 4th.